Okay, hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm gonna do a series of exercises to reinforce the ideas that we covered in game theory with the lectures this week. All right, so the first exercise, consider the following situation. It's been modeled as a normal form game. We have two players, row player and column player. So row player is choosing C or D, column player is choosing C or D. If column player, if row player chooses C and column player chooses C, column player, or row player's payoff will be two plus gamma. Column player's payoff will be two. So the first payoff, the one before the col before the comma, goes to row player. The one following the comma goes to column player. And so if row player plays D and column player plays C, row gets three, column gets zero. And I'll follow that convention throughout all these matrices. All right, so the first thing is, assume gamma is equal to zero. Does anyone have a dominant strategy? Explain why or why not. Does the value of gamma matter? Then part B, continue to assume gamma is zero. How would you expect the players to approach the game? Give a count of your prediction, such as Nash equilibrium. Then consider a situation where gamma can be anything. Desi uh, designate a particular non-zero value. Give a reasonable interpretation. Provide an account of how the game changes. All right, so let me go ahead and just kind of solve the game. So the first thing I did is I took out the gamma. Just wrote this as 22300311. Okay, very good. Then following my uh, best response method, underlining the payoff corresponding to a player's best response, if column player is going to play C, row player better play D because 3 is bigger than 2. If column player plays D, row player best responds with, with D because 1 is bigger than 0. If row player plays C, column player best responds with D because 3 is bigger than 2. But if row player plays D, then column player best responds with D because 1 is bigger than 0. So I've underlined the payoffs that each player gets when they're playing their best response. Because I have both payoffs underlined for row player following D, we know D is a dominant strategy for row player. What does D dominate? It doesn't dominate column. What strategies dominate are your other strategies. And so D is dominant over strategy C for row player. And furthermore, D is dominant over column player strategy C. Which, which means that D is always a best response for both players. This reinforces the Nash equilibrium. Two underlines here signifies a Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium is DD. The Nash equilibria, the payoffs in Nash equilibrium are 1-1. One, one. This happens to be a dominant strategy Nash equilibrium, though you can have Nash equilibrium equilibria that don't involve dominant strategies. What's the effect of gamma on the dominant strategy? Well, D is a dominant strategy over C for row player if gamma is smaller than one. C is a dominant strategy for row player over D if gamma is larger than one, right? Think about if gamma is bigger than one, then the payoff from playing C when column player plays C, the payoff to row player for playing C would be something bigger than three. So that would make that makes C a best response to C. And similarly, if gamma is bigger than one here, then row player's payoff for playing D when column player plays D would be something bigger than one. So that would make C a dominant strategy. Gamma has no effect on the other player, no effect on column player. So if you hadn't quite followed as I, how I solve in the game, have a look at my how to solve games uh, by looking for how to find Nash equilibria matrix games video, and that'll walk through the process. All right, let me make sure I covered everything that I wanted to talk about for this one. So continue, Sue, we did this here. Yep, consider a situation where it can vary. Yep, we did. Oh, so so I said get a reasonable interpretation for gamma and provide an account of how it changes the game. At this point, incorporate some psychology. Well, maybe we give an interpretation for gamma, like a positive gamma as a measure of pride. So you get maybe, maybe we'd say something like you'd get this numerical payoff for choosing C when when column player chooses C. But suppose this is like cooperate and this is defect and you feel some sense of pride for cooperating. Maybe you get this additional psychological boost. And so that's what I've, that's, so I've tried to infuse a little bit of psychology there. That's, I don't know, that's just some additional interpretation from the standpoint of modeling because I have a background in behavioral economics. So I think that's interesting, but all right, uh, question two. Consider the following game that models interaction between a police officer who can choose whether to inspect or do paperwork and a person who can either steal or watch TV. The payoffs represent the officer's desire to inspect if the other player steals and otherwise devote time to paperwork while the other person wants to steal if no inspection is going on. Parameter X, bigger, X positive measures years in jail. All right, so yeah, if you steal, then you lose years. Yeah, positive X would mean you'd lose years because you'd be spending that time in jail. 
All right, so for that one, I'm asking, are there any pure strategy Nash equilibria? Why, why not? Assume X is equal to zero and solve for all Nash and mixed strategies, then find all Nash equilibrium and mixed strategies for any positive X, and then give a criminological interpretation for the Nash equilibrium. All right, so the first thing is there's no Nash equilibrium in pure strategies. We can do that solving for by the best response method. If the person decides to watch TV, the police officer would rather do paperwork, so I, I would underline a one here. But if the person decides to steal, the, the police officer would rather inspect, so I'd underline this. However, if the police officer decides to inspect, the criminal would like to watch TV, so I'd underline here. If the police officer does paperwork, the criminal would like to steal. And if you notice, I underlined... I would underline this one, I'd underline this one, I'd underline this zero and this one, and there's no cell with two underlines in it. So there's no Nash equilibria in pure strategies. Next, I look for mixed strategy Nash equilibria. So the criminal is gonna choose TV if their payoff from choosing TV is higher than their payoff from stealing. This indeed is the payoff from watching TV, right? If you watch TV, column player gets zero with probability Q. Whoops, I got these backwards and gets, um, and gets TV with probability uh, one minus Q. So matter of fact, I can fix this real quick. Nobody saw that. No one was no one was paying that close of attention. So no one no one saw what I did right there. So this is actually this is actually P. How about that? That's horrible. And then how about this? This is going to be one minus P. All right, I gotta get rid of this. I gotta get rid of that here. Let's see. This is gonna be Q, one minus Q, and this is gonna be Q. And now I've gotta blot out this part that I don't want because this is gonna cause all kinds of problems. Here I'm in the middle of this video. I love it, it's great. Good, 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 good. Hey, look at that. Looks almost, almost like I meant to do that. Almost like I meant to do that. All right. So column player is going gonna, is gonna to get this payoff with respect to uh, stealing TV and this payoff with respect to, sorry, this respect to watching TV and this with respect to stealing. I don't know. Maybe they steal the TV. Who knows? Um, so they'd get zero with probability. Oh, I lost my P. How did I how did I manage to how did I manage to screw that up? All right. So they're gonna get zero with probability P plus zero with probability one minus P, where P is corresponding to the frequency with which row player plays inspect, and uh, Q is corresponding to the frequency with which column player chooses TV. They'd get minus two because we have stipulated that X is two if they steal with probability P and they'd get one with probability one minus P if they were to steal. All right, so then solving, this is just some algebra and we find that if the, if the police officer chooses to inspect with probability greater than, well, equal to one third makes them indifferent, but strictly greater than one third will cause the, will cause the criminal to choose TV rather than steal. Why? Because this penalty becomes severe. Now let's check for inspect. When will the police officer inspect? Well, the police officer inspects if their payoff from inspecting is higher than their payoff from paperwork. So the payoff from inspecting is going to be zero with probability Q and one with probability one minus Q. That's this, zero with probability Q, one with probability one minus Q. And their probability from paperwork is going to be one with probability Q and zero with probability one minus Q. Okay. And then just the arithmetic to solve, we find that if the criminal steals more than half the time, that's enough to induce the police officer to inspect. Otherwise, if the police officer, or if the if the criminal is not stealing more than half the time, then the police officer would uh, would choose paperwork. All right. So then our Nash equilibria. So find all. What, let's see. Find the Nash equilibria. So the Nash equilibrium. This looks scary. This is just saying, what's my probability waiting over this strategy, prob over inspect? What's my probability waiting over paperwork? What's my probability waiting over TV? What's my probability waiting over steel? And so it's uh, if, if P is one third and one minus P is two thirds, and if, if Q is one half and one minus Q is one half, this gives us 
whoops, I should be pointing over here. This gives us a Nash equilibrium and mixed strategies. Remember, the idea with choosing these weightings is to keep your co-player indifferent. And that's really important for this criminological interpretation down below. Remember, with mixed strategy Nash equilibria, you're not trying to keep yourself indifferent. You're trying to keep your co-player indifferent. Let's go back over that. When I was talking about inspect, or, sorry, when I was talking about TV, we were saying, well, column player, if they choose to watch TV gets zero with probability P, they get zero with probability one minus P. Look, these are column players payoffs, but this P is controlled by row player. Row players choosing P to keep column player indifferent between TV and steel, right? That's the idea. Uh, okay, so similar work. So suppose we find all Nash equilibrium mixed strategies. Well, here we'll just replace two with X. So where was that two is like right here. So we replace that with X. And if you solve, you get, you get the following uh, weighting. You'd get, uh, you'd get, p would have to be bigger or bigger or equal to strictly bigger than uh, one over x plus one, and then uh, and then one minus p would be x over x plus one. If you're staring at this, you're like, wait, what's going on here? Remember, when we had x was two, what happened? The weighting was one third and two thirds. So if we have x is two, this is one over two plus one. Oh, one over three is one third, right? Or we have two over two plus one, two thirds, right? That's all this is doing. All right, so then what was the criminological interpretation? Well, the weight the prospective criminal places on T, on TV, right, Q right here, uh, doesn't change with x. So I'm gonna move my microphone. So the crime, uh, so so crime stays the same with more effort being placed on paperwork as long as the values of x decrease the weight the guard places on inspect. Harsher punishment does not induce less crime. It's important to recall the underlying intuition between Nash equilibrium and mixed strategies. Each player is choosing their mixing distribution so as to keep the other player indifferent between their strategies. Right? Harsher penalty isn't 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 changing the likelihood of TV. Right? X isn't what's governing whether or not TV or steel happens. What's governing whether TV or steel, ha steel happens is the frequency with which the, uh, the police officer is, um, is uh, inspecting versus uh, watching TV or doing paperwork. All right, question number three. Consider the following situation has been modeled as a normal form game. So here we have four plus gamma or four plus oh, what, uh, psi. 0 plus psi, and then uh, 2, and then minus 3, 2, and 0. All right, so we assume this is equal to 0. So firstly, and then we, and then I want to find some equilibria. Let's see. Then. Under what conditions can column player expect row player to play up, or what conditions can row player expect column player to play left? Is this a prisoner's dilemma? Find all Nash equilibria. So that's all this is. All right, so the first thing that I did is I said, all right, indeed, suppose this is 0. So that just gives me this game, 4, 4. 2, 3, 0, 0, and 2, 2, right? When this is 0 and this is 0, we just have 4, 4. See, I'm avoiding saying what this Greek letter is because I, I forget. That. So this reminds me of like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and this reminds me of the sigh that Raphael had. So I don't know why I thought of that. It's just how my mind works. Um, in terms of Nash equilibria, by best response, if column player is choosing L, row player chooses up. As their best response, if column player chooses right, row player chooses down as their best response. If row player chooses up, column player chooses left as their best response. If row player chooses down, column player chooses right as their best response. No one has a dominant strategy. However, there's two Nash equilibria in peer strategies, up left and down right. Find Nash equilibria in mixed strategies. Well, here I've got Probability P is the prob is the weighting that column player is placing on L. Q is the weighting that row player is playing on uh, on up. And so let's see, my payoff. So find the Nash equilibrium mixed strategies. My payoff here four with probability P, zero with probability one minus P. Right, four with probability P, zero with probability one minus P. I'm comparing this to two with probability P versus two with probability one minus P to tell me if row player would rather do up or down. And column player is choosing P so as to keep row player indifferent between up and down. So I want the expected payoff of up, so four with probability P, zero with probability one minus P to be equal to, uh, choosing down, two with probability P and two with probability one minus P. So that's this right here, right? Let me back this out so you can see. So this is 4p plus 0 times 1 minus p. And when this is bigger than 2p plus 2 times quantity 1 minus p, then row player will choose up. 
right? This is four with probability p, this is zero with probability one minus p, this is two with probability p, and this is two with probability one minus p. And then solving, if p is bigger than one half, makes row use up. And then for column player, let's see, we want four with probability q plus minus three with probability one minus q is when column player chooses left. And then zero with probability q plus zero with probability one minus q is when column player chooses right. And we want q to be bigger than uh, three sevenths makes column use left, right? So if Q is bigger than 3 sevenths, then column player is going to be attracted by this 4 and choose left. Otherwise, column player is going to, um, is going to choose, uh, choose right because they're trying to avoid this minus 3. Okay, so that was our, so our mixed strategy, our mixed Nash equilibria, mixed strategy Nash equilibria is going to be 1 half, 1 half, and then 3 sevenths, 4 sevenths. So pretty sure I've got this down here. I sure do. So let me go over the first part. Under what conditions will column expect row to play up? If column believes row expects column to play left, columns can be fairly confident row will play up, especially if row knows this. All right, just looking at the game. If we think we're going left, then they're, if, if we're expecting to go left, so if we're expecting to go up, then we'll go left, or if we're expecting to go left, then we'll go up. And that's all that's saying. Under what conditions can row expect column to play left? Uh, oh, this is, I, I did those both at the same time. Is this a prisoner's dilemma? No. Prisoner's dilemma requires each player has a, has a dominant strategy, and when they play their non-dominant strategy, the joint payoffs are, the sum of social payoffs are higher than the outcome when they, when they play the Nash equilibrium strategy. So this is not a prisoner's dilemma. We also know it's not a prisoner's dilemma because it's a coordination game because we've got two equilibria. Okay. Let's see, and then finding our Nash equilibria in mixed strategies. I did this already, so that I, this is just reporting the Nash equilibria. It's going to be three sevenths, four sevenths, and then one half, one half. Um, three sevenths, yeah, three sevenths was the probability for up. I think when I reported this, I think I said one half, one half, and then three sevenths, four sevenths. We should report the three sevenths first, then the four sevenths, because this is re this is from Rho's perspective. So up with probability three sevenths, down with probability four sevenths is the Nash is the mixed strategy Nash equilibria that's this right here because these are the probability with which you're playing up this is the probability with which you're playing down for row player and then one half one half for the probability column plays left and right and when they when they use these probability distributions over their strategies that'll keep the co-player indifferent which means nobody has a profitable unilateral deviation which is required to reinforce the Nash equilibria uh, suppose Raphael psi is not equal to zero, given an interpretation. Um, so this could be like some additional psychological boost for uh, for playing up. I don't know. You'd have to tell some story. I didn't. I left that blank. I guess I was feeling less inspired than when I wrote the question in the first place. So, uh, oh shoot! I showed us. <clears throat> uh, question four. Consider the following situation: ten silver dollars lie on a table. Two individuals take turns picking one or two coins from the table until the first one, first time one of them picks up two coins. As soon as somebody picks up two coins, both individuals are sent home. Each one keeps the money they've picked up so far. If somebody takes a coin in a situation where exactly two coins are left on the table, the last coin is given to the other individual, and those individuals are sent home with their earnings. Uh, first thing is we wanted to model this as a game. <laughs> model is an extensive game. How many strategies do they have? Find the backward induction solution. I did not organize this how I should have. Here's how the game would look. So at the very end, they'd split five, uh, $5 each. So this is, so number one, number two, number three, oh, sorry, what am, I'm counting here. Number one, number two, number one, number two. These are player one and player two. That's all the, at the top. That's what those are. And then this one and this two is like take one, take two, right? If you take two, the game's over. If, for, if player one takes two silver dollars, game's over, they get two, the other player gets zero. If they take one, the game continues, it becomes player two's turn to play. If they take two, game's over. Player one gets the one they took from before, player two gets the two they would have taken to end the game. If they take one, now player two has accrued one, player one has this one, plus if they end the game, these two, that gives us three. If they don't end the game, if they only take one, then it becomes player two's turn again. Player two has now accrued 
let's see, one, uh, one, uh, player two would have accrued one from right here, from this one right here, plus two for ending the game brings us to three. Player one, if player two ends the game, would only have this one plus this one. Whoops, I don't know why I did that. Um, I don't know why I did that. Puppy study break. Hey, puppy study break. Puppy study break. How about that? Good. Uh, so this, if you fill out the same logic, that brings us to the end of the, to, to the end of the game tree. Now solving, what I've done is I found our backward induction solution, and I've just indicated red for player one, blue for player two, and what I've shown is like I want to do. Player one can choose five, or they can choose six by taking one or taking two. Player one likes six better than five, so player one's going to take two. Now player two is looking forward and is going to say I can get four, or I can take two and I can get five. Right? I could take one and get four because player one's taking two for sure and ending the game. Or I can take two and end the game, and I'll get five. I'd like five better than four, so I'm going to take two here. Then player one is looking forward and saying, oh, I can get this four by taking one, or if I take two, I get five, so I'm going to take two. Then player two is looking forward. I can take one and get three, or I can take two to end the game, and I'll get four. Player one's looking forward and expecting three if they take one, because they're expecting player two's going to end the game, or if they take two, they get four, so they'll take two, so on and so forth. This unravels to the very end where we expect player one's going to take two immediately, and the game's over. Game should end immediately. So that's sort of like the miserable so solution with the, with the centipede game. Uh, let's see. So that was extensive form game. How many strategies does each player have? It's actually two to the fifth. So 32 strategies for player one, and then two to the fourth, strategies for player two why well you might think the strategies are just one two one two or so on and so forth no strategy is a complete contingent plan and so actually there's like this many combinations because player the strategy has got to tell player one so there's i can give you several different strategies so if i say take two on take two at this node but take one at this node and take one at this node and take one at this node and take one at this node that's a different strategy from always take two or take two here, take two here, but take one here, but take two here. That's another strategy. So there's, you know, 32 such strategies. Strategies are strategies are complex for a for an extensive form game. You have to have a complete contingent plan that specifies what you do at every at every information set. This is more a conceptual sort of like point sort of point. This isn't a good econ 401 question. This is more like hey, I'm teaching you extensive form games and I want you to be prepared for getting something like this when you take the 409 game theory class. So I don't want this to be the first, I don't want that to be the first time you see this idea. So this is more, this is a good discussion question. This is like a terrible multiple choice or exam type question because it's, it's a little bit obscure relative to intermediate micro. All right, so backward induction solution is player one always takes two, player two always takes two. Notice this way, I'm tell if I say always takes two, this is strategies, not not payoffs. Also, these right here are strategies. Two, 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 take two. Uh, if I say always take two, that covers me. That gives me a complete contingent plan. It tells you what you're going to do everywhere. Uh, that's a different strategy from always take two until the end where you take one. That's another different strategy. But anyway, if I say always take two and always take two, that's what I need for the Nash equilibrium. It's a complete contingent plan. Uh, okay, consider the following game. Every player submits a number between zero and 100 with the goal of guessing the value to be who's the closest to two-thirds of the average of all the numbers submitted. Whoever guesses closest to two-thirds of the average receives the prize P, which is the event of ties, is split N shares. Typically, the prize in class is like, ten dollars but with a large section it's hard to do i don't know i guess venmo but there'd probably be too many ties and then before you know it i'd well puppy study break wouldn't have any puppy food anymore puppy here's a puppy there's a puppy all right um so find all nash equilibria give the economic intuition supporting uh and you find tell me why it's an equilibria tell me how you play the game well the nash equilibrium is actually everybody plays zero uh, there's unique Nash equilibrium for everyone selecting zero. If everyone plays zero, no one can gain by deviating to any other X. However, playing zero is a pretty bad strategy in practice. So most people reason selecting randomly would give 
uh, 50, two thirds of this is 33. People play strategically rather than randomly, so we, we might expect we should take something smaller than 33. Typically, in my experience, when, when people play this game, the, the two thirds of the average tends to be somewhere between 17 and about 32. The most common winner for two thirds of the average is about 20 or 22. And then if you play it again, it drops down to maybe 13 the second time. So there's something interesting going on here. This is actually based on this game right here is based on Kane's uh, beauty contest game, thinking about spe uh, 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 picking or speculating on uh, stocks. So the beauty contest, you're the, I think the way, I don't remember, it's like, like a newspaper or something. It was like, suppose you see, we, we <clears throat> vote on who we think is, which picture has the most beautiful face, but it's not who you think is the most beautiful. It's who you think, the majority of other people will think is the most beautiful, which is a very different question, right? If you think of which face you think is the most attractive, that may very well be a different face than what you would expect everybody else to judge as the most attractive face, right? And that's exactly the beauty contest. So you think of that, the application to uh, picking stocks. And uh, anyway, so that's, that's interesting. But this brings me to the end here. No more puppy study break pictures. I used them all, so oops. Anyway. <laughs> Go ahead and conclude here. Have a good night, everyone.